student ambassador and PhD affiliate. And here at CID, our mission is to build a thriving world for all. So we work across the university and a global network of researchers and academics to build an international pool of talent, convene academics and researchers and practitioners and deploy break, break through research to address the world's most pressing challenges. So that's why I'm excited to um, about today's fireside chat on humanitarian and development leadership in a time of change. Before we start with our fireside chat and um, with Michelle Noon and uh, Fatima uh, Zumar, we I wanted to give you a couple of um, um, yeah heads up. So there there's lunch here today. So I would ask you to just um, the lunch is composable. The, the trash is composable, so please uh, throw it out um, away afterwards. Um, we will hold a Q&A session right after the, the talk. So I ask you to keep your questions and I'll then go around with a mic um, and we can have the questions. Um, today's session is also being recorded, but only the, the voice um, from the audience is being recorded. Um, so your um, faces, et cetera, will not be um, seen in the recording. Um, however, our um, CID team member, Miguel, um, he will also take photos. So if, and these photos will also be shared on social media. So if you do not wanna be on a photo, please let him know. Um, and yeah, lastly, please make sure to sus subscribe to CID's newsletter and follow um, Harvard CID on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, you know the drill. So without further ado, I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker for today um, who has a very impressive uh, resume. Michelle Nunn is the president and CEO of the humanitarian organization CARE. She leads more than 8,000 people working in 121 countries to save lives, defeat poverty, and achieve social justice. In her nine years at the helm, CARE has taken its fundraising and impact to new levels, reaching more than 53 million people in 2024. Michelle believes in human solidarity, that lasting impact comes from people advocating for change at the community level and that the most powerful tools are often also the simplest. She co-founded the volunteer mobilization nonprofit Hands on Atlanta, led its 2007 merger with President George Do Bush, Points of Light, and was the CEO of Points of Light for six years. She graduated Phi Beta Cum from the University of Virginia with a major in history and a minor in religion. And she earned a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government here at Harvard University and received a Kellogg Fellowship to study faith and social justice in more than 12 countries. She now lives in Atlanta with her family. And Fatima Zumar, um, who will also be moderating this fireside chat, as you all know her, um, she's the CID's executive director and she is the um, executive director of the Harvard Center for International Development and she's an adjunct lecturer in public policy at HKS. Fatima has a Okay, but she also has a very impressive resume. <laughs> so, um, yeah, with further ado, please come. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? All right. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. Um, we are really excited that all of you are here today. I'm so excited to have Michelle here. Michelle, welcome back to Boston from Atlanta. I'm delighted to be here. And I graduated in 2001 and I don't recognize anything uh, 20 years later. It's like, wow, this is fancy. Um, what's, what's some of your biggest changes that you've seen since you're well, back? First of all, um, safety and security, I guess. I mean, we, we would, there was no such thing as security checks when I was here. And, uh, and then it's just like the buildings have all changed and they're, you know, they're extraordinarily beautiful. And, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm impressed at the growth and, um, and I wish we weren't in a state in which we had to have security <laughs> checks to go to class. Well, hopefully, hopefully that will resolve at some point, but we're delighted that you're here. And, um, I wanted to say, for those of you who haven't had a chance to meet, I'm Fatima. Um, one of the things I'm so excited here at CID, and one of the reasons I'm so excited Michelle's here with us um, today is, you know, I, I meet with a lot of you. We talk to a lot of students about what the INGO space, what civil society looks like, um, what's really happening in the sector, both over the last 10 years. But increasingly, of course, we need to position ourselves for what's coming next, um, both U.S. elections, but even beyond the U.S., 
there's been a super cycle of elections all around the world, India, Indonesia, and many other places. Um, and so organizations like CARE, which really emerged out of the post-World War II era in many ways, um, as they thought about how to really position themselves at the intersection of those on the front lines, communities on the front lines, and how to bring their voices to institutions of power to help really make systemic change. That's what CARE has been leading at the forefront of so many years. Michelle, your leadership there is so incredible for so many different reasons. Um, maybe just to kick us off, Michelle, um, as you, before we go forward with where we are today going forward, could you give us a little bit of a reflection? You've now been at CARE for about a decade, is that right? Almost, almost a decade, yeah. All right, um, I'd love like to, just to hear as you reflect on a decade of your leadership, what, what have been some of your proudest moments? What have been some of your struggles in some of that? How do you think about where CARE is over the past decade as we think about going forward? Yeah. Well, maybe I'll even take it back a little bit more in history and just think about the fact that CARE was uh, founded almost 80 years ago. We'll be marking our 80th anniversary next year. Uh, and uh, I, I like to think about the sort of CARE origin story because I think we build upon that legacy. And it was a couple of people actually in New York City who said, we're not going to stand by and watch as, as people in Europe are facing starvation. They, um, they created a kind of coordinated uh, committee of 22 organizations, but they invented the world's first care package. Um, so the actually, when you think about the care package that you might send or receive um, to, when you were in camp or... Uh, where you know that you that you that we all see as a sort of sign of generosity and connection that actually started with the organization care and it stood for cooperative assistance and remittances and relief it's, it's changed over time in Europe and then it became everywhere and uh, you know they they figured out how to get within a few months twenty thousand care packages from Philadelphia to La Havre France. And, and then over the course of the next basically 20 years uh, to deliver 100 million care packages. So when we talk about social entrepreneurship and we talk about scale and innovation, I always think about the example that that was you know, 80 years ago. And by the way, they were figuring out how to get care packages to people in post-World War II Europe, and within uh, within 30 to 60 days, they could get a, you would get a receipt that said your $10 care package went to such and such family, um, and they received it here. You know, so an amazing kind of history and heritage, and that sort of connection and solidarity. I have an aunt who was and when I joined CARE, she said, I love CARE. When I was a Girl Scout, uh, I raised money for CARE package and we sent it to a little girl in France and her name was Anne Marie Brune. This was 70 years later. So that, that sort of connection that I think CARE stands for. So think about that legacy and the fact that we've had you know, literally tens of thousands of people from around the world that have built upon that legacy. And now we do still emergency response, but we also do long-term development. And we're, of course, a very different organization. We don't deliver packages in that way, but we, um, you know, we have over 8,000 people in places around the world. 95% of our staff are from the places in which they serve. And, uh, and so over the last 10 years, I think one of the things that we've been thinking about is what is the role of of a uh, of a global NGO in uh, in this day and age, and so we're thinking a lot about, and we can talk about this building networks, um, using our platform for social entrepreneurs, locally based social entrepreneurs, to scale their innovations and take those forward. Um, for us to again create. Uh, localized um, approaches to all of the work that we're doing and to use the capacity for Global North, Global South uh, Network for advocacy, for scale, for private sector partnership. So all of the positive sides of a network with the positive sides of a localized uh, sort of set of actors. Now, over the course of the last um, few years, we've had a global pandemic. We have had um, crisis like Ukraine. I don't think we could have been, none of these things. If you had said, what do you anticipate doing when you sign up for care? I will say almost none of the things that I have been, I have, um, been leading through would I have, would I have envisioned. Um, you know, a Trump administration, again, a global pandemic, Gaza, 
Ukraine. And so it has been a challenging and in some ways harrowing, I think, a few years for those of us in the international development humanitarian sector. And at the same time, I think it's also, you know, you sort of feel like, okay, but care was built over 80 years for moments like this. And so that's what I'm trying to keep in mind. What's, what's your proudest moment in the last decade? No, I think my proudest moment is is um, absolutely the 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 ability to support amazing leaders around the world. So it's not like one sort of initiative that care. I mean, I could I could say I'm proud of the fact that care um, is the coordinator of the largest micro savings program in the world. We have over 21 million people that are a part of our savings group model. It started with 30 women in Niger. Uh, I'm part. Of, I'm proud of our farmer field in business school, which is working with millions of women smallholder farmers, and we're scaling that across the world. I'm proud of our uh, humanitarian partnership platforms, which are a form of localized activation that started in the Philippines and where we can go from 35 people to 3,500 people in, uh, in just about 48 hours. So there are initiatives and programs that I'm proud of, but I think ultimately what I'm most proud of is the fact that we are supporting change agents around the world that are a part of cares constellation and that are partners in civil society so people like Bushra who leads our humanitarian work in Yemen um, and uh, wears a full burqa and has to have a male uh, you know a company or wherever she goes and yet she's gone from derision in the community to people saying I want my daughter to grow up to be like you uh, Dalmar who is uh, survived his own family a famine and now does leads all of our work with the IPC to identify uh, the the places in the world that are technically facing into famine. So uh, an amazing constellation of people that despite all of the challenges in the world are um, are overcoming them res- and building resilience and standing with their communities. Um, so I want to call I want to go some deeper on a couple of themes you mentioned. So one of them is Let's start maybe with the humanitarian side as we think about some of this. Um, you know, humanitarian. If you if you go look back eighty years, it tended to be both really about like famine or natural disaster relief. We're increasingly in a time where we have so much man-made disaster as well, right? With a lot of political conflict and wars. I know CARE is super active in many of these um, hotspots and spaces. There's been a huge push towards localization coming out of many institutions, including USAID's new localization strategy. Um, in, in many ways, I think CARE is at the forefront of a lot of that. It's not, I don't think you've been, my read is you haven't been reacting to just a push of localization. I think many of your structures have been set up to do that. I know in the Philippines and many other places, particularly in humanitarian response, where you're so embedded in local communities. But as we think about an increasingly warmer planet, more and more, um, natural disasters, but also political man-made disasters that are coming. It seems to just be, we read the news, we're so despondent all the time with what's happening. Um, How do you think about, and then funding keeps going down for the very same communities and the same things. And it seems to be such a rat race to figure out where these shrinking budgets are coming from, whether that's official development assistance accounts, ODA, whether that's philanthropy that's coming in. Um, Certainly, there's been a shrinking, and we expect a shrinking coming from Washington, from London, and other spaces. As you think about kind of what's coming on the humanitarian spaces, as you think about localization, what does that mean for an organization like CARE that's been thinking about this for a long time? How do you you help position not just your own organization, but you're really kind of a front leader in the broader INGO sector as well? How do you position what that leadership looks like? So there's a lot in there. Um, I will just say, when I started at CARE, we we do both development and humanitarian work. Uh, we we were about 30% humanitarian, about 70% development. We are now at about 55 to close to 60% humanitarian. Uh, versus development. So that is in response to the state of the world. And so one of the things that's concerning is I think we are potentially crowding out and in the you know imperative to respond from a humanitarian perspective, we're crowding out uh, funds and support for the longer term development work. So we're all grappling with that. I think we're all grappling with the realities when we talk about the election and the many elections that have happened around the world, none of which actually seem to portend that there will be more resources available from an institutional perspective to do the humanitarian, the basic humanitarian work. And 
and the the long term development work that is so important. Frankly, also to 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 enable communities to be resilient to the humanitarian needs and especially natural disasters and climate changes, which we know are 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 coming. So um, so I I would just start by saying it's a conundrum. Um, I think that we are all challenged to think about, and from an organizational perspective, maybe just the I'll 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 go down a little bit deeper into one example, which is this humanitarian partnership platform that I mentioned to the Philippines. Uh, so go back to 2014. We did an after action review around a natural disaster um, typhoon that hit the Philippines to say what went well, what did not go well in our response. And what we realized is in the Philippines, which is one of the most uh, sort of disaster prone countries in the world, um, it was taking us way too many days to be able to get to the, the surrounding islands where people were impacted and affected. So uh, sort of Fast forward, and there's their care helped to orchestrate a group of local organizations that came together in a co-created space to say, we're going to let's train and support the capacity for uh, organizations that are not necessarily doing humanitarian response all the time, but to work together to be able to, to really cover the entirety of the Philippines and to, um, to have the kind of capacity for orchestration together and uh, to build our response. And so as a result of that, this, this network is now the second largest responder to disasters, uh, except for the, the Red Cross in the Philippines. As I mentioned, we can go from 35 people up to 3,500 people, we can hit 95% of the Philippines within 48 hours. And when I say hit, I mean in a good way. Um, uh, we can actually support and uh, engage uh, those communities. And I think all of that comes from also the understanding that the first responders in any natural disaster are not the people that we send in, they're the people from within a community. And so often, one of the things that I would point to in terms of CARE's long-term evolution around this is a recognition that, um, so often they are women and women who are protecting their children, who are supporting their families, who are doing the work of community, both response and rebuilding. And they are uniformly uh, not at the table yeah for humanitarian response and so many other things. And so one of the things that CARE has been doing for a number of years is something we call a rapid gender assessment, which enables us to quickly go in in the wake of a humanitarian response and say, these are the gendered aspects of response that need to be considered here. Everything from gender-based violence uh, to issues around um, access to nutritional food. It's you know, a whole host of things. And then we inform the broader or sort of system around that. So, so I think this idea of how do we go more and more local with networks of capacity for response? How do we make sure that people at the table are the ones that are actually doing the response that are really doing the hard work? I'll give you just one example, which is in the US, we sort of have been thinking, what is our application of things that work around the world in the US? And wondering like, is there an application? We have a big humanitarian you know, ecosystem here. But, but what we discovered is that when you go to the Gulf Coast, for instance, amazing organizations like the Red Cross are getting most all of the attention and resources when those locally based organizations who are doing a huge amount of the actual work are getting none. And so we have set up a network in the United States in the Gulf uh, largely women-led and BIPOC-led organizations, and we are creating that same kind of orchestrated system, and we're getting money directly to them. And by the way, we're doing cash assistance directly to those people who are most impacted with a focus on women of color, who, if you look at the statistics, when a disaster hits, disproportionately go into debt versus white families, for instance, who can find a way of getting additional resources after an, a humanitarian emergency response. So I'd say all of those things are, are important. And on top of that, I do think we have to challenge ourselves. CARE was born in a post-World War II uh, moment. Most of our humanitarian infrastructure is still built upon that infrastructure. And as it has served in many ways quite well, there is also a real need for reform, for disintermediation, for new ways of operating from a humanitarian sector perspective. And I think it's imperative that we think more boldly and creatively about those opportunities. 
Let me pick up on that for a moment. Um, you know, and for all of you in the room and, and watching online, so I want to underscore what Michelle just said. You know, we are at another historic crossroads in the development sector, right? So we are in kind of that 80-year uh, milestone moment post Bretton Woods. Bretton Woods, of course, just up the road here up in New Hampshire, um, where you have the birth of the IMF, the predecessor to the World Bank Group, the United Nations institutions that come out of this, and many of the civil society architecture and infrastructure start to then come in the 1950s, in the 1960s, right? Um, and they're largely based out of Europe, in the United States. And it sets the kind of global terms for how aid flows are gonna work. The governance for these institutions tend to be very European and American held and how the governance infrastructure works of these institutions, how the funding flows work, who gets to make decisions and who gets to decide not just where we're gonna work and when, but how, right? And so what Michelle's alluding to, and I just wanna make sure that all of you are picking up on, cause it's such an important point, not just for care, but in the broader conversation right now is, there is a fundamental rethink happening right now of what are the new norms? What are the new rules for the road for the next 50, 80 years? Do we just keep going with what we've inherited? Or is the world fundamentally different um, and is it time for a new type of thinking and model? So that's something that these conversations have been happening just two weeks ago at the annual bank fund meetings, for instance, in Washington, DC, this was a hot topic of conversation. This will continue to be a topic of conversation. Um, in lieu of that, Michelle, let's- Can I just yeah. say, we're, we're having to do that in the face of, you know, it was this, this was the year that people said the world votes. Well, most of the votes have, have turned towards a more inward uh, sensibility, a more nationalistic sensibility, not an internationalist, not a globalist sensibility. I'm, I'm generalizing. Uh, but um, so I think there is this interesting opportunity. What do we need to preserve and what do we need to fundamentally reform and change? And I think we're going to be challenged to do that. And uh, it's hard to hold both of those things at once uh, because there have been parts of the international order that have uh, that that we want to continue to build upon from the perspective of we want international humanitarian law, for instance. We want a fundamental belief in the rights and dignity of all people. How do we how do we go back to some of those sort of charter dimensions of our human rights infrastructure and at the same time embrace the kind of dramatic reform that I think is going to be called for globally? And just remember, one out of every three people roughly went to the polls this year in the world, right? And that's just if you look at United States, India, and Indonesia combined, that's roughly one out of three. There's many more elections beyond that as well. And to Michelle's point, most of them voted for authoritarian type leadership in some kind of way or in leadership that really, all men, first of all, outside of Mexico and um, leadership that really turns to a very strong nationalistic frame um, where we could, we could see a world in the next 10 years that pulls back a lot from multilateralism from international norms, from international human rights law and the like. Um, should we talk about the election? Let's do. Let's do. <laughs> Let's. All right. So at least here in the United States, we had a big, big election. I'd love, you know, maybe at an institutional level, um, how is care positioning itself to think about here in the U.S.? Of course, there's ripple effects beyond the U.S. Of, as well as we think about the international development sector but we're, we are seeing a shrinking already in the UK, for instance, we're seeing um, that happening throughout Europe. We know ODA and budgets are, have already been shrinking, continue to shrink. Um, for an organization like CARE that really depends in many ways on the system working, right? And multilateral systems to work. How are you thinking about the next decade ahead coming out of what happened here in the United States and beyond? Well, so just a, a, on a personal level, I will I will say so I'm from Georgia, which is one of the battleground states. Uh, I um, ran unsuccessfully as the Democratic nominee for Senate in 2014. So I have been following politics from, uh, uh, you know, up close and and from uh, farther afield with my care hat on now as a bipartisan organization. But I do think we have to recognize that this election ushered in 
um, a dramatic set of changes that uh, the world is going to be responding to and the United States is going to be responding to for some time. And I think none of us, I mean, I think leading up to the election, CARE had um, a scenario planning set of committees. And it was like, oh my God, how do you even begin to plan for these completely different scenarios? And then even within these scenarios, there's so much uncertainty about how this is going to play out, right? And so, and even within the current scenario, I think there's still some degree of uncertainty around what direction this is going. When we, when Donald Trump became president, uh, you know, we initially um, were prepared for a whole sort of dramatic set of cuts. At the same time, we had bipartisan support in Congress that protected those. Um, those investments that the U.S. makes around humanitarian international development, diplomacy, and uh, it's, I think it's much less clear uh, in this second administration what the bulwark will be from a congressional perspective. Um, we'll have maybe some indication of that over the coming weeks as we, as we see the, the response to the nominees and um, and so and and the and who will be, for instance, appointed to lead USAID is just one example. So, um, from a care perspective, I think obviously care receives about a third of our budget from from the U.S. government, and so we will be moving into a kind of. Uh, uh, I would say a advocacy strategy on both offense and defense to um, to basically tell the story of how important these investments are. But I do think as someone who ran for Senate and who understands like most of the constituencies in America are not voting around international aid and development. And in fact, we have our work cut out for us to make a more clear and effective story of the efficacy of those investments. Because I think if you ask an ordinary American right now, how do you think we've been doing in terms of development and humanitarian assistance? We all know that, for instance, poverty has been going down if you look at the trajectory over the last few decades. You know, every like rotary club that I ever have talked to when I ask that question, almost everybody raises their hand and said, poverty has gotten much worse over the last 20 years. So why would anybody continue to think it would be a good idea to invest in something where they think that we are actually not making any progress? So how do we tell the story of the urgency of need around humanitarian response at the same time that we tell the story of positive impact and the efficacy of investments? And, and we have to continue to sort of press around What's the broader narrative? And I'll tell you, we may be put to the test because if Elon Musk um, creates a list and puts it on X and says, well, you know, what do you think are the uh, investments that we should stop making on a list of one to 10? How do you think that we it will do to say, you know, $60 billion investment in uh, development, humanitarian response and, uh, and diplomacy? Like, I'm not sure that the American public in a survey on X is going to raise their hand and say, by all means, let's protect that investment. Um, and so, you know, I do think that we're at a fundamental, uh, real challenge around our narrative, around telling our story from a policy perspective of efficacy. And, uh, and the last thing is, I think we have to also consider you know, are there reforms that we think we have to and should be making proactively in order to, uh, you know, to to take this 80 year set of systems and not move incrementally, but move more exponentially. And those are the kind of conversations that I think we're going to have to start having. And those are we need all of your good ideas for that. So I hope that folks in this room are starting to imagine the um, the creative possibilities that we should be putting forward. Um, well, I love that call to action. And we're going to pivot actually in a moment to all of you and hearing your questions. Um, but I want to underscore Michelle's call to action because I do think it's really easy sometimes, even I'm falling prey to this, where I turn my phone on and I just read the headlines and I have anxiety and I get a little bit depressed and it's hard to understand what can we do anything about any of this? What is our role here? We're all here to kind of help change systems, to think as systems thinkers in our own spaces, right? Whichever whatever whatever it is you're studying. Um, before I turn to the students, what gives you hope? And what's your own call to action to our students here, but to all of those watching around the world at the same time? And I'm filibustering for all of you for a moment. So think about questions that you wanna ask Michelle. Uh, well, 
I think what gives me hope is that community-based change driven by um, sort of extraordinary change agents is happening all around the world at every moment at this. At, and so, um, and we, that may not be in our headlines, um, but there is, uh, there is amazing resilience. When I think about the members of, for instance, some of our partners in Gaza who are uh, delivering babies every single day into in the, in a conflict zone in which they're risking their own lives. And in fact, some of them have lost their lives over the last few weeks. Uh, I, I, I have a particular story of a, a woman who I think is emblematic of the possibility of change making that I'll just and then we'll turn it over to the bigger the, the bigger um, conversation around systems and policy and so forth. But I think we don't want to lose sight of people centered um, change and the capacity for change agents um, around the world to do the work, which they, which they're doing every single day. Um, a woman named Salamatou from Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and, uh, she was married against her will at age 13. She had five children by the time she was, uh, 20 living in desperate poverty. And she, um, met a care staff member. They together helped create the first, what we call our savings group model, our village savings and loan group model in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, she has a huge knack for entrepreneurship. And in fact, she, you know, she has a huge knack for anything that she would do. I would just tell you, she is indomitable, Salamatu. And, uh, and so she grew her business uh, was able to afford to send her children to school, divorce her husband, remarry, and on top of that, she has now personally uh, helped organize 20,000 women in Cote d'Ivoire into these savings groups. Um, and I met her a couple of years ago again and just asked her, what is her vision for the work that she wants to do going forward? And she said, I want to, I want to recruit others like me to be these village agents and to, to do this work. She said, you know, a small investment would enable to be do this. CARE invested about $150,000 into this initiative. She sent me a video about two weeks ago um, with 56 other change agents just like her uh, that are going around and recruiting people for the savings group model. And um, they have in two years recruited and engaged 48,000 people that are in these savings groups. Um, and these savings groups are providing a huge, um, I mean, they're like one for every $1 invested, $18 return over five years. So I do believe that when we invest in people proximate to the challenges um, and and they then become systems changers. And by the way, uh, half of the women that are elected to politics in Niger have come through one of these savings groups. So they become the change agents and the hope and the possibility for the future. And so I just keep thinking about those people as I think about some of the challenges that are ahead. Um, you know, I just want to before I turn to all of you, I just want to say, you know, one of the things that I know in our classes here, we talk a lot about, and Michelle referenced scale a lot, right, in systems thinking and how we think about getting everything to scale. I th actually think, you know, a lot of the examples you gave, Michelle, you gave some terrific examples of how care from the care packages onward has taken things to scale around the world in dozens of countries where you are. Even as we work at scale, which is so important, so I know so many of you here, don't forget the people on the ground. Like this is a person by person battle to think about the kinds of societies we wanna build and create. And that doesn't change. It's even more important as we go forward um, to what's to come all around. Um, and that's what lays the groundwork, I think, for so much of this innovation, the entrepreneurship that then institutions can come in and scale, right, in many ways. So there's such a role, I think, for each of us, for each of you. Um, let's hear what's on your minds. Uh, Brian is gonna run a mic and Jasmine, they're gonna run mics. Um, stand up, introduce yourself, say your name, which program you're in, de-acronymize if you don't mind. For Michelle, um, it's, been a, it's been a couple of years since she was here, so maybe some of the programs have changed. Um, and let's turn to all of you. Michelle, maybe we'll take a couple at, uh, together. Is that okay? So we can hear from as many people as possible. I'll let you run the mic. Thank you. My name is Ioannis, and I'm with the MC MPA program, Mid-Career Masters in Public Administration program. Um, something that connects me with care is my mom was 85 years old, had her first job working with care in Cameroon as a typewriter. So I'm very much 
One of the things I used to work for the UN, one of the challenges that I've seen with the development and the humanitarian space is that there is lack of collaboration. In a time when there is this leadership change, how do you see collaboration becoming that, 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 that strong force to really make sure that you know we can still we can still go over through these difficult times? Because you see, save the children, DRC, I mean the Danish, you know, Oxfam, they are all working in the same space and solving the same issues and meeting the same kids, you know, families. How do you see the power of collaboration coming in? Thank you. And we'll also take a question from... Thank you. My name is Sean. It is a mid-career takeover. This is what we're known for. I'm a research fellow this year. I'm sorry, I'm PPs. <laughs> my name is Sean. I'm a humanitarian worker. My specialty is gender-based violence during crisis. What I want to understand from CARE's point of view and on a higher level, what does the conversation look like when you talk about incorporating AI and um, how, what might be some of those approaches that CARE has been thinking about incorporating AI moving forward? Thank you. Hello, my name is Sabri. I'm a, a MPID, so a Master in Public Administration and International Development student. <laughs> uh, I'm from Morocco and I used to be a humanitarian worker also with the UN. And my question is related to funding. So you, you've mentioned localization as being central uh, and I'm a really big advocate for this. But for me, when we talk about where the money comes from is contradiction with localization. Because as you've said, uh, the European and US leading where and how the money is being spent is a contradiction with localization. So in this time, do you think it is time to think about new actors bringing in money into the sector and which kind of actors would you target to bring new funding into the humanitarian space? Yeah, okay, those are all great questions. I don't, I, yeah, I was gonna say um, yeah, very small questions, yeah. Um, so for the collaboration, I think I mean, look, we th this is a, co a complex sector with multiple actors. There is some level of duplication, there's some level of competition, and there's some level of collaboration. Um, I think what you what we're going to to what is going to be imperative, especially as we face potentially declining resources, uh, is more collaboration and potentially consolidation. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I think we will see that. Um, certain organizations may need to realign and, and care may be one of them in terms of um, how, we, how we move forward. I will say that uh, there's nothing like a good challenge to bring people together. And now there's nothing, nothing like a good challenge to bring people apart as well. So I think the test of this will be uh, whether, we, um, whether we, for instance, as a, as a sector, um, really rise to the occasion. And also I would say put on our, and this is where I would continue to, I would say, I do think for those of you who are um, in an academic institution at this moment of time, you have the extraordinary both social capital, intellectual capital, and you know I know you you all are incredibly busy, but you have some capacity to use your use different uh, levels of aspiration and imagination to think about what comes next. And for those of us who are you know at, at trying to make sure that we uh, respond to the latest um, crisis in our organizations and maybe lack a little bit of the space for that creativity, I would just say that to the degree that you can come to partner with organizations like CARE and others and bring some of your best ideas and thinking, and I think that's one of the roles here that is so exciting for um, CID is that's going to be necessary and important. Um, and uh, and I will say that I am a little heartened by what, for instance, I have seen better collaboration, more collaboration around, for instance, our advocacy for Gaza between the you know a half dozen INGOs than I've seen in my ten years. Now, I think it has not been necessarily effective in terms of the outcome, but in terms of the way in which organizations have come together, uh, worked in private advocacy, signed on together to New York Times op-eds, you know, those kinds of things, we, you know, we have seen that. And I think it's a building block for the set of broader challenges that are ahead. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, 
in terms of uh, AI, maybe while I um, <clears throat> No, well, I, I'm going to call upon Emily, uh, who is my colleague here, while I get a little water because she's better at answering this question anyway, and because I wanted to call upon her so that others will come and, and find her. Um, yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Emily Janak. I'm the Associate Vice President of Thought Leadership and Design at CARE. I'm MPP class of 2011, so MPP's in the room. I swear it's possible. I've actually been working at... <laughs> It, it does work out. Um, I've actually been working at CARE since I graduated, so I've, I've been around for a while. Um, on the AI question, so one of the big pieces of my job is thinking about how do we actually take evidence and use that to change the world? So how do we think about what we know? We operate in 120 countries. We talk to millions of people every year. How do we actually plow that back into what do we do next? What op-eds do we sign on to? What evidence goes into those conversations? And AI can be a huge tool for that. If we think about how are we using AI to understand what the people in the communities we serve are saying and want in their lives. Rolling out AI just exactly as it exists right now would probably be the opposite of helpful in a lot of the communities that we're in because AI isn't talking to those people, but we can fill some of those gaps. And there's just a lot of ways we can speed up the work that we do by using those tools. Um, but it's also one where we have to influence the tools because they are at the beginning of their journey and they're evolving very fast. So we have to think about what guardrails do we need to put in place and how do we move forward? So I'll just add to Emily's point. Um, we are, we'll be kicking off in our spring semester here at CID. Our theme for the year is gonna be AI and international development. And that culminates in our global empowerment meeting, which will be April 28th, 29th, um, in collaboration with Harvard Business School. Um, and we will be having an entire Road to Gem programming podcast, speaker series, career chats to really go deeper on some of these issues. Um, we'd love to invite Kara to come back to be part of that conversation as well. But we really want to make sure that with the fourth industrial revolution, as we think through technology, AI has to work for the communities we care about. They cannot just be an afterthought as part of this conversation. And it's our collective jobs to center our communities as part of that. And so we want to really put some intellectual thought and space behind that. So we're going to continue this conversation um, as we kick off the spring semester as well. And love to have you back for that. Well, oh, that was just the perfect uh, opportunity for me to pass the buck. Um, so I'm so glad I had a little coughing attack um, so that I could call upon Emily. Um, and and I would just say that we already are using, you know, in, in a very simple way, just being able to take thousands of survey points of information from the women that we work with and then to say, this is what they want. It's actually different from what the development world might be delivering. I mean, one of the things we learn is that actually what people, women want more is income and livelihoods more than anything, more than food, more than, you know, I mean, of course that's a pathway to food, but that is the number one priority. And I think, you know, rather than having um, graduate students sit in a room for three weeks to collate that information, we now can turn that over. And so I think there's a lot of exciting possibilities. I look look forward to the outcomes of your conference. And and I think I will just also say in 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 a, expression of humility that INGOs like CARE, even though we're big organizations in some sense, we still are, I would say, at a very rudimentary level in terms of the utilization of AI. And so I would, I would, that's another point of, of opportunity for, I would say, contribution from people like those that are in this room is to help us um, to maybe leapfrog versus to be so incremental in our approach to AI. So that is such a big, okay, the big for the financing question, because where does the money come from, right? And so um, I do think that, uh, I mean, obviously private sector partnerships, uh, sort of crowding in new forms of financing, impact investing, stakeholder capitalism, all of those things, I think we're going to have to, to sort of reimagine. You know, when, when we think about it from a care perspective, for instance, you know, at a very, in a very simplistic way, uh, if we want our um, if we want our our country offices to be able to uh, to partner with local corporate private sector actors, we probably are going to have to actually subsidize that for some period of time. And so um, there's an interesting thing that I think we're going to have to do, which is what is the leveraged investments that we're going to have to make in order to create more locally based private 
set sector partnerships um, because you know if our organizations are used to getting a twenty million dollar investment from USAID to get a ten thousand dollar investment from a local corporate partner that would probably be a lot. They're like, you know, why, why should we spend time with that? Well, it's be, partly because we have to think also, what are the totality of assets that um, the private sector can bring? And how do we engage them, not just from a philanthropic perspective, but also from a broader uh, business system and program perspective to reach the kind of scale, which I think necessitates a different kind of set of partnerships. Um, and beyond that, I think the thing that we get caught up on again and again as we think about reform is financing. And, you know, if you reimagine all sorts of new possibilities, but you don't think about where the money is going to come from, then I think we continue to doom ourselves to 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 frankly, failed reform efforts. And so, again, I think new forms of financing and the kind of. Um, uh, you know, I, again, creativity that's going to have to be a part of that, I would say, is an opportunity for smart people in the room. We've got a couple more minutes, so let's do a lightning round. I'd love to turn to an, a gra an undergraduate student first. Any undergrads here who want to uh, ask a question? To make sure we don't crowd you out. Anyone? No? All right. Any non-Kennedy students have a question first? Oh, great. Here we go. Then we'll come back. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm non Kennedy. I'm other side, MIT. So, <laughs> oh, the reason why I'm here is because I would like to know more about um, care strategy on partnering or working with startups like those focused on AI and blockchain, but most importantly, those focusing on serving a situation like you to have a better outcome in the merchant market. Others? Hello, my name is Hyung Sik. I'm an MPP student, uh, <laughs> Masters in Public Policy. Um, it's very exciting to hear that call to action to reimagine how this institution can deliver on that impact. Um, I'm particularly interested in the role of the private sector beyond the mobilization of capital. So uh, what have you seen like private sector doing in a new way that worked? And what do you think we can do to make that happen more often? Hello, my name is Michaela. I'm also an MPP in Professor Sumar's class. Um, my question is kind of similar about kind of entrepreneurship and the role of entrepreneurship in international development. I know that that's kind of like a, you just mentioned that women are often asking for livelihoods and for jobs more than they're asking for some of the more traditional things. So what is CARE's current strategy for kind of promoting and boosting up um, the practice of entrepreneurship in these developing countries? Finally. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Rasha Musleh. Um, I'm a racial justice fellow at Car Center here at Kennedy and also an alum of the MCMP. Again, another MCMP, sorry. Um, I have so many questions, but I'm going to try to focus on two. One is, uh, okay, one, only one, only one. I'll, yes, ma'am. So one thing that I was thinking of when we, I worked with the UN for 10 years and part of it was crisis intervention in addition to development. And we worked on giving people the power in order to respond to emer emergencies, especially that we're in a chronic emergency there. One thing that people kept on telling us, like, please don't leave us, because one of the things that for them, you're giving us this and then you're leaving us. You're just coming and giving us these tools, which are great, but then you're going to leave us and this will continue to happen. I wonder what was CARE's experience in this area and how you deal with this. Hey, um is that it? okay? So um, I, I would say that I would love to continue the conversation. And I think I'm going somewhere else after this for another. Yeah, so if anybody wants to join, please follow me to. Yeah. Once you finish the questions, then we'll tell you about the career chat. Okay. Again. So um, I think we are all incredibly interested in how do we use innovation and entrepreneurship to uh, dramatically expand our capacity for impact. And I will also say, as an 80-year-old organization, just like big organizations of, you know, Facebook or Coca-Cola or any others, a lot of times they're outsourcing their innovation. And I think CARE is, we, you know, we definitely have innovative programming. And at the same time, I think we are also increasingly looking at partnership 
or how do we uh, buy innovation versus build it, for instance? And so um, I, I think we're desperate for good ideas. So I'd love to have a session with you at MIT to talk about how we do that and how we um, creatively, uh, cre you know, and, and I, I would say we also have something to offer because we operate in a hundred plus countries. And so for entrepreneurs that want to bring something to scale, like come work with us because we already, we know how to legally work in all of these countries, but we need the best solutions. We have something called 10X that is the, the idea is take locally based um, entrepreneurs and then say to them, let's scale together across CARES work. So um, I think we're really interested in that. Um, I think that I, I might answer two questions with one answer around this private example of private sector mobilization beyond capital um, and and new ways of working uh, around um, entrepreneurship uh, is, um, you know, Master, women's entrepreneurship in particular. Uh, we have a partnership with MasterCard. Um, MasterCard made a $5 million investment in care to help us in a set of countries to unlock the potential for women entrepreneurs. So one way of deploying that capital would be to give that out to entrepreneurs. I think what we did instead was work with uh, banks and financial institutions in those countries and help them unlock what the barriers were to uh, women having access to entrepreneurship. And there's a whole set of things that were standing in the way. As a result of working with these institutions, we have uh, we can count that just in the last few years, $150 million worth of loans have been unlocked for women. And so I think there there is a, um, a really big opportunity. Now that's also sustainable because we're stepping back and those in at least one of those banks, it's the most successful product that they're in, that they're using right now because they simply took into a, to effect what do women want, women entrepreneurs, and what do they need in order to be able to be effective and successful? So um, I do think that the challenge is we too often turn to private sector actors in a, it, through there, and we too often, frankly, have entry point only through their philanthropic foundations and not through their business operations. And, and even they internally often have a hard time unlocking their business operations um, so that we think more broadly about uh, the capacity capacities for integrating change through the entire business line of, of these private sector actors. So again, I think there is um, really big opportunity around some of those questions. And I would love to, uh, you know, interns, fellows, um, or just good advice, anybody in the room, come, come and talk to Emily and come and talk to me uh, about how we can uh, take your ideas and, and carry them forward in the world or help you amplify your ideas by supporting them. Last word, um, before she does that, just to tell you all, if you're inspired, I'm really inspired um, listening to all of this. If this is something that interests you, Michelle has graciously agreed to do a career chat with a smaller group. That will be in the CID Perkins room on the fourth floor of Rubenstein, um, and that will kick off at 1.15. So if you're interested in careers, internships, other types of opportunities at CARE, or more broadly in the INGO sector, what could that mean? Um, please come join Michelle for that in Perkins in 429 Rubenstein. Um, Michelle, such an honor. I wish we had more time because I have so many more questions. I know all of you do as well. I'm actually going to give, thank you for being with us here at CID. I'm going to give Jasmine the last word. Drink my, uh, I will drink my coffee and tea with you in mind. Uh, and um, I, I hope that, um, I, I would just say, I do think this is a, you know, there, there's lots of things that are challenging about this moment, but I hope that you all are finding new reservoirs of energy, hope, inspiration, the analytical tools that you need to change the world because we're looking to you um, for, for the kinds of, as I said, imaginative, solutions and systems change and policy and advocacy change uh, that can usher in um, the next chapters of hope and uh, and care. So I hope that you all are feeling, um, I hope you're feeling a sense of 
um, being called at this moment and uh, and use it as a, a point of inflection for, again, for inspiration and for urgency. So thank you all. Thank you.